Hi everyone, welcome to the another class of the course structural biology. We are going through the module of introductory section and today as told in the previous class at the end, we are going to discuss about decoding biological macromolecule. So, how to decode biological macromolecules? The first and foremost requirement is to understand biological macromolecules is to read them. You know, you have to know about their basics. You have to read how the monomers are forming polymers to start knowing about. We are targeting three polymers, carbohydrate, protein and nucleic acids. And then we are also interested in knowing about lipid and fat. So, how the primary sequence of those polymers could be studied? What are the challenges in studying them? What are the possibilities of improvement where in terms of instrumentation, in terms of technical development, people are working, we will try to make a preliminary discussion. This is not the core topic of our study, but I sincerely believe that if you do not know how to read the basics, you should not go to the higher level. So, let us start with reading carbohydrates. Carbohydrates as I told are considered as a very, very important molecule because look at the food sources and you will get the most accessible sources, they are very, very rich in carbohydrate. And if you look at as we have discussed in the previous class, carbohydrates are connected through glycosidic bonds. A glycosidic bond or glycosidic linkage is a type of covalent bond that joins carbohydrate molecule to another molecule. It might be carbohydrate or it might be others. So, basically what happen in case of carbohydrate you have a hydroxyl group which is connected to the carbon and you have another carbohydrate if we consider carbohydrate containing the hydroxyl group. Now, it will go through a dehydration loss of water and it will make a bond like that. This is called a glycosidic linkage. Now, as I told here you see that the carbon and oxygen this bond and this bond they are single bond. So, when we are thinking about the architectural hierarchies, what I mean by that from where there are monomers one unit, they connect to form polymers. Now, they would go on the higher level of structure. But if they are connected by single bonds, in between any conformation, remember I told about three secrets of covalent bonds, which are chirality, configuration and conformation. So, here they would adopt any conformation because free rotation is possible. That is the trick here free rotation and that is why the prediction would be very difficult. Polysaccharides a long chain of monosaccharide linked by glycosidic bonds. Different polysaccharides are connected through different type of glycosidic bonds. Let us take a look. So, this is if you see alpha 1 4 glycosidic bond this is present in amylose and you see that when it is alpha 1 2 4 this is forming straight chain.
Now, when you look at another glycosidic bond, this is in cellulose and this is a beta 1, 4 glycosidic bond. So, as I told, once you see 1 to 4, they would be forming straight chain, be it a alpha bond or be it a beta glycosidic linkage. Now, you see the branching where you see the presence of both alpha 1, 4 and alpha 1, 6 glycosidic bond. This is present in a polysaccharide which is called as amylopectin. So, you see when you have 1 to 4, you get straight chain, when you have get 1 to 6, you get branch. Number of such permutation and combinations are possible. This along with the presence of a single bond in the connectivity makes it nearly impossible to study carbohydrate. Forget about structure, even when you have to read the sequences for each and every bond, you have to use separate enzymes. Also, when they are complicated for a same bond to get access, you need other enzyme. And this is very interesting because if you look at modern science, modern science is very much relying on utilizing what we call waste source. It is called waste to wealth. A lot of biochemical engineers, enzyme engineers, polymer specialists, they are involved, involved in utilizing what we used to say waste before, now they are trying to valorize them. And one of the classic example is lignin. If you get any waste, as an example, you could take any waste from the field where the crops are coming. Okay? So, let us say from the paddy field, from from wheat, from corn, any waste you get, you get a big amount of this as lignin. You will get cellulose, you will get hemicellulose and you get lignin. So, a lot of research is currently going on where people are trying to degrade lignin because if you could degrade lignin, you could get a lot of value added product like comarinic acid, synapinic acid and all. But because of the complex bonding they have, it required a lot of different enzyme. And what that is doing, it makes the involvement of multiple enzyme enhance the cost. When you are working with waste, you want it the process to be cost effective, but it is not. Same problem actually happened in the field of carbohydrate everywhere, where we are not being able to get a sequence. So, the problem I put lipid and fat here together because lipid and fat is not a polymer, but the problems now we are talking about is same. It become very expensive. More importantly, if you look at the polymers, the biological macromolecules, they have two very distinct difference. One in one group, there is DNA, RNA and protein. In other group, there are carbohydrate 
lipid fat. What is the difference? If you see in the cell, there is chromosome. In the chromosome, there is genes which are made of DNA. The genes will tell you what would be the RNA or protein. So, what I mean all the DNA, RNA and protein, they have a pre-made template. But in case of carbohydrate lipid fat, you do not have any template. Their synthesis is non-template based. And because of that, when you are investigating a particular cell, you have information about the chromosome, you know what type of DNA, what type of RNA, what type of protein you are going to have. But you are clueless about the carbohydrate and lipid that is very critical. Non-standard for DNA, you know that there are 4 nucleic acids where the differences happen. RNA is the same, for protein there are 20 amino acids. But carbohydrate, though we say that monosaccharide are forming polysaccharide or in case of fat, glycerol and fatty acid. But there are number of fatty acids, number of monosaccharides which could be very, very different there is no standard set for them. That is another problem. And they are very individualistic. They are very or even inside a group of same organism, it depends on the food intake and many other things. So, what in summary I am trying to say in case of carbohydrate, lipid or fat, first of all, even if you know about the organism, even if you know about the cell type, you still have no clue unless and until you do the everything. So, there is no guessing. When there is no guessing, there is no prediction model. You know, a field could only be proceed further when you could develop a model for them. I know if this is coming, this would be this. Once biology gives you the opportunity of making rules, then only physics, chemistry and mathematics comes into and makes things develop in a proper way. Understanding goes into next level, which is a real problem in case of carbohydrate, lipid and fat. In case of protein sequencing, it is the practical process of determining amino acid sequence of all or part of the protein or peptide. So, remember we talked about this is the amino acid which is having NH3 and CO minus with a R here, R group on the top and hydrogen. So, if you see when a one amino acid want to join with other amino acid, it would be I just make the charge taken out. So, COH and NH2. So, here again one water molecule that is the fate of most of the polymerization where dehydration happen and you get
So, this is the bond joint. Now, apparently, this is a. So, first of all, what are the problems? Though this is the peptide bond, but this peptide bond behave differently, give different access. How the peptide bond could be? The first criteria is to break it, and the enzyme who are doing that is called protease. There are different type of protease, let us say serine protease which works through the catalytic residue serine. There are diff different even serine protease, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, a lot of them. Now, for all of this specified enzyme, they have different choices. So, again you have to use a combination and when you have to make combination this is costly. So, this may serve to identify the protein or characterize its post translational modification. I did not talk about, but I will try to explain when I am going into the protein part. The protein it is synthesized in the ribosome by covalently linking the amino acids, but after the process of synthesis which is called translation is performed, then there are enzymes in the cell in the body which could modify the protein. Like there are residues which are called having hydroxyl group like serine, threonine, tyrosine, they could be phosphorylated. In that way, methylation, acetylation, there are post translational modification. The two major direct method of protein sequencing are mass spectrometry. By the way, mass spectrometry is a field which have progressed a lot in recent time. So, I talked about the difficulty of carbohydrate and lipid, but using mass spectrometry and using high resolution NMR, it is possible to identify them individually, we will talk about. Mass spectrometry methods are now most widely used for protein sequencing and identification, but Edman degradation remains a valuable tool for characterizing a protein's N terminus. Sometime, as I told, these are template based. So, you know a little sequence in the N terminus and you could get to find out the protein. That is done by Edman degradation. What is Edman degradation? Edman degradation is a method of sequencing amino acid in a peptide which was developed by famous scientist Pierre Edman. In this method, the amino terminal residue is labeled and clipped from the peptide without disrupting the peptide bonds between other amino acids. So, you could do that one by one, that is the beauty of the method. But it have a lot of problems. This process will not work if N terminus has been chemically modified. For example, acetylated or uh, pyroglutamic acid is there, any modification. Sequencing will stop if a non alpha amino acid, non essential amino acid is encountered, like isoaspartic acid, since the favored five membered ring intermediate, which is essential for the process of this reaction to go on is unable to be formed. Edman degradation is generally not useful to determine the position of disulfide bridges. Also, it requires high protein concentration. But beside the Edman degradation, even the normal sequencing uh, using mass spectrometry is not very useful because as I told, you have to digest, you need, the one problem is you need combination of enzymes 
Second, individually the process is very expensive. So, this is not a process you could perform in a regular basis to the requirement of each and every protein you want to know. That is one of the biggest problem. So, we talked about carbohydrate, we talked about lipid, we talked about protein. The only polymers which are left are nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. We will come to that, but before that I would refresh your memory with the DNA research timeline and I would include few new which would be extremely critical to proceed us in the right direction. So, first DNA research breakthrough was with in 1865 with Gregor Johann Mendel. We know he is called as the father of genetics and uh, using the peas he did an extensive uh, hybridization and develop basic laws of genetics. In 1869, Frederick Misser, he come up with the nucleic acid which he called nuclein. In 1878, Albert Kossel from the same lab, Hope Sayers laboratory, he come up with the name nucleic acid. He also identified that this molecule consisted of four bases and sugar molecules. In 1909, Russian born American scientist Phobos Levine isolate ribonucleic acid and characterize the building blocks. In 1928, Fred Griffith carried out experiment on the pathogenicity of streptococcus pneumonia using a virulent and an avirulent strain. His experiment would not be very conclusive, but that opened the field which was continued in 1944 by Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod and McLean McCarty who actually have taken the factor add protease and DNAs and show that when there is DNAs the factor which is virulent factor is not effective. So, it is DNA. Again in 1952 a more biochemistry oriented confirmation came from the famous Hersey Chase uh, experiment where they use labeling of protein and DNA using sulfur and phosphorus and confirm that this is genetic material, this is DNA. Now coming to the new ones which I did not talk about. In 1950, Erwin Chargraff provide Chargraff's rule which is in natural DNA the number of guanine unit equals the number of cytosine units and the number of adenine unit equal the number of thymine units. So, this is important definitely, but this was more critical I am coming to. In 1952, the real breakthrough come through the work of Rosalind Franklin. She studied the structure of DNA using X-ray diffraction. The first time people have used DNA to determine structure. She worked very hard to make a better and clearer pattern multiple time data collection. Her discoveries indicated that DNA has a helical structure. This is Rosalind Franklin and this is the famous pattern and from this pattern they have even identified the, the, the distance between the two bases. In 1953, Watson and Crick who were working, but they were trying to fit a model using Chargaff's ATGC rule, but they were unable. But by looking at Rosalind Franklin work, it helped them to build a 3D model of DNA out of cardboard and wire. Their models were not correct or successful, 
until they solve Franklin's X-ray patterns. Then they are able to build the correct model of DNA which is double helix. So, this is Watson and Crick and this is the famous DNA model they build up. When I am talking about DNA structure, I could not like stop mentioning about my favorite scientist called Linus Pauling. Linus Pauling was a chemist and that is definitely one thing I love about people like me who shifted from the field of chemistry to the field of biology. So, if you look at in 1931, Linus Pauling contributed to quantum chemistry with the work on the nature of the chemical bond where he talked about the improvement of valence bond theory as well as the concept of resonance. If singly that would be contribution from a one scientist, they would be happy enough. But Linus Pauling then along with Robert Corey discovered the protein structure using diffraction data. He was awarded with Nobel Prize for this work. He was not stopping even. The reason I want to talk about him here, we, we now know about the DNA structure there in A, B and Z form and we know which form comes when and all these things. What is not mentioned regularly, the first model came from Pauling. This is the first model where he talked about the helical nature of DNA. So, the first breakthrough, the first concept was given by him. Only thing is, he was talking about triple helix. But it was proved that DNA is clearly a double helix proving him wrong in this case. But today if you look at you will see that there are Hookstein base pairs where there is evidence of three nucleoside forming interaction together and forming triple helix. So, it is not clear what he found that time might be he was unlucky to get not the regular DNA but the Hookstein pair. There might be many possibilities. Interestingly, this guy did not even stop there. He was also awarded Nobel Prize because of his contribution in peace. So, a rare scientist, a rare uh, you know personality, but why I bring him here is because of the concept of helicity which came from him first time, which was critical to solve the structure of DNA. Now, we will talk about the basic properties of DNA. The base pair which is a fundamental unit of double stranded nucleic acids consisting of two nucleobases bound to each other by hydrogen bonds. They form the building blocks of the DNA double helix and contribute to the folded structure of both DNA and RNA. Dictated by specific hydrogen bonding pattern, Watson Creek base pair allow the DNA helix to maintain a regular helical structure that is subly dependent on its nucleotide sequence. So, if you see there are three hydrogen bond between cytosine and guanine and two hydrogen bond between thiamine and adenine. And uh, here is the animation you could see how they are forming. Coming to replication, DNA replication is the process by which DNA makes a copy of itself during cell division. The first step is unzipping it is to unzip the double helix because double helix is bound with non-covalent interactions and base tacking and hydrogen bond. So, unzip the double helix structure of the DNA molecule and this is carried out by the enzyme called helicase which breaks the hydrogen bond holding the 
complementary basis of DNA together. Now, when I am talking about this uh, like incidence, one thing I am missing and that is very vital in biology. Yes, helices play the most important role to break it. But think about you have a gypped molecule, you unzip it, there is another like again a chance to re -gyp. So, there are complex of protein specially called single strand binding protein which binds to single strands after unzip. And in that way, there are many protein comes and play their role to develop complexes which play very critical role, but most of the time we give the credit to the main one because it is so complex. Second is complementary base pairing. So, in complementary base pairing, the complementary nucleotides move into the position to bond with the complementary bases on the DNA chain. So, you see that this is the template strand and the bases are coming according to if there is a A, it is T, if there is a G, it is C and vice versa. But if you look at a very interesting thing here, you see that the nucleotides are coming as triphosphate. So, they are coming as DNDPs and two phosphates are actually relieved. This is a very critical and interesting phenomena. If you think why they are doing that, take a look at the process of DNA synthesis. The nucleotides many So, suppose there are 100 nucleotides, let us say they are forming a polymer which is from 100 molecule to 1 molecule. So, if you think in terms of thermodynamics del G equal to del H minus T del S, entropy is significantly reducing, reducing makes the del G positive, which means the reaction, the polymerization is not spontaneous. So, you need more energy to make del G negative that complementation is coming through the inorganic phosphates. Th when they relieve, they breaks and they release a negative amount of energy minus 7.3 kilojoule per mole. That energy is compensating the del G positive value. That is one thing. So, the reason why they are coming as DNTPs is they are actually complementing the thermodynamic energy. But there is something more to that. Think about a nucleoside could have come to the cell from food or other things, right? Now, when we say deoxynucleoside, it could enter into the cell, enter the cell, but a DNTP molecule could not enter the cell. Why a DNTP molecule could not enter the cell? Because in presence of three phosphates, they are 
very negative in charge and membranes are outside of the cell membrane is negative. So, they are repelled. So, any nucleoside or more importantly nucleoside analogs, if they have to enter in the cell, they cannot enter in the form of DNTP. If that would happen, then there would be many foods which might give us nucleoside analogs and they could be killing us. We are saved because of the process that DNA cannot receive it in the state of monophosphate, it is take it only in the state of triphosphate, hence the selectivity of proper nucleosides and not the nucleoside analogs entering in the DNA. So, as I told it is a thermodynamically driven reaction and specificity matters. The third one is formation of the new sugar phosphate backbone. The nucleotides join as the sugars and phosphates bond to form a new backbone. This process occurs due to the enzyme DNA polymerase which also checks for mistakes as it goes. So, DNA polymerase is important, but if you see that, that is what I am trying to say, there are many other enzymes which are taking role in processing the whole thing. So, one take home message one, it is a complex, but DNA polymerase is the main enzyme and processivity or you could say proofreading activity of the especially the eukaryotic polymerase makes the synthetic process nearly error free. The process of replication is studied in detail and that helps to go for development of a process I am coming. Before that, I will talk about central dogma. Though I talk about replication, but you see in the central dogma, a DNA could develop another DNA through replication, a DNA could develop mRNA through transcription and mRNA make protein through translation. So, if you see these three are interconnected and if you know the sequence of one you could read the sequence of others and DNA is the first of them. So, this makes the selection of the candidate towards sequencing focused on DNA because now we realize if we could read DNA molecule, we could eventually read mRNA as well as protein. But there are other processes like development of sugars, nucleosides, amino acids, lipids going to function, we have no clue how to read them. So, information obtained from DNA sequencing would help us getting information in different levels to understand life. We will know about RNA. So, in the next level and we will also know about the protein. But if we want to sequence what would be the molecular mechanism to choose selection. We already talked about the molecular level of DNA structures. We know that they differentiate only in the nitrogenous bases. So, we have taken the nitrogenous bases along with the sugars. You know in DNA there is only one hydroxyl group instead of two and if you take 
this 3 prime hydroxyl group this 3 prime hydroxyl group you will get a molecule like this and this molecule would not continue the DNA synthesis process because this residue this 3 prime hydroxyl is essential for elongation. So, somehow if you could introduce a molecule like this instead of a molecule with hydroxyl group, you could stop the synthesis of DNA. I am coming to that, but before that I want to talk about polymerase chain reaction. As I told the DNA replication process was observed very keenly and based on that in development there is a development of process called PCR polymeric chain reaction by Carrie Mullins. He got Nobel prize for that. So, what is PCR? It amplify large quantities of DNA in the level of microgram to milligram from small quantities generally there are trillion fold of amplification. So, you get very tiny amount of DNA and with the help of PCR now you could get a handful to do your further experiments. Analyze single DNA fragment out of large complex mixture like human genome mixture of 12 million 300 base pair fragments you could do that. Altered DNA sequence if there is mutagenesis you could have identify them you want to do mutagenesis you could perform through that. What are the component of PCR reaction? One template DNA you have to give the original DNA which you want to elongate primers as we know now by our previous findings that DNA polymerase cannot work without the presence of primers. So, you need to have primers. Thermostable polymerase I talk already about DNA polymerase they are important, but here in the process to make it out of the body you have to provide the temperature changes you have to develop temperature cycles and protein being stable through non covalent bonds could not be stable in that condition. So, you need a thermostable DNA polymerase which is TAC polymerase thermus aquaticus. The finding of TAC polymerase actually revolutionized the field of biology by getting the instrumentation which is PCR. So, you need DNTPs there adenosine, thymine, cytosine and guanine. You need proper PCR buffer with magnesium and ultimately you need the instrumentation which is called thermocycler. There are variables in the PCR to optimize which are temperature, cycle times and related temperatures, primers, buffer and the DNA polymerase the enzyme. And when it was started we have looked for a thermostable enzyme, but later we realized that more eukaryotic in nature the enzyme would be, more or better proof reading activity it would have, you will get it in a situation where the reaction would be perfect, errorless. So, ultimately when you do that there would be exponential amplification. Uh, if you have 30 cycles, you will get 2 trillion copies in theory. So, that is what the revolution we have. We had DNA around, but now with a tiny amount of DNA, we could make it a handful. So, I already talked about the concept of this dideoxynucleotide triphosphate, which actually stop the reaction that along with PCR amplification leads us to something 
which we were dreaming of to read which was came from frederick sanger known as sanger sequencing what is sanger sequencing you have the first step where you have the dna you make the dna fragment then you add dntps as in pcr but in addition to that you will add ddntps then you continue the pcr so there would be a competition whenever the ddntps would be enter in the dna it would stop so you get a series of different fragments at the initial stage the fragments were measured by radio level but with time fluorescence level come which was followed by this one which is capillary electrophoresis capillary electrophoresis before it was you run the big gel plates agarose gels now you have capillary electrophoresis which enhance the resolution much much better but more importantly when it goes through the capillary you start reading it by applying a laser so you heat with the laser the capillary you get sick fluorescent signal different for different nucleotides and that would be recorded in a chromatogram and from the chromatogram you could read the sequence our dream fulfilled first time we are able to read a biological macromolecule this is revolution this is where we start going into the in depth analysis further information we could get from it the initial seed happened so looking at sanger sequencing 800 plus nucleotide base length could be studied through that accuracy approaches 100% sanger is considered as the gold standard still now from when it was invented so there are other sequencing technique like maxim gilbert but because it's a structural biology course i just want to introduce what i need to proceed with if i want to talk about all those details i probably could not be getting time enough to talk about what we are talking about so sanger sequencing we are talking about because till now it is relevant still now you have to do gene sequencing you will go for sanger sequencing why sanger sequencing was revolutionary that's why i talk i make the background now i hope it is clear to you guys that reading macromolecules was really difficult carbohydrate it is impossible because of so many branching single molecule rotation through the single molecule and all these things lipid a small but again a variety of them are there so you need all those to be identify individually again you have no template so you have no clue you have to work individualistically so it's 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 very very like intense work and that demand a lot of money protein is template based better than carbohydrate and uh, lipid to read but again to break the peptide bonds you need different enzymes edman degradation is working but there are many limitations and at the end we find yes dna rna we have a beautiful method along with pcr where we could make the amount high as high as possible with every single cycle it would get increase the amount of dna or rna we need so together with carry mullins and sanger we are proceeding towards a direction 
which all the biologists are dreamed about. And if you see now, as I talked about, when you get the gene sequence, you have the codon relation, you will get the protein sequence. So, you get the DNA, you get the gene, you get to read the protein sequence. So, the unraveling of the biology, unraveling of the life started with the finding and establishment of PCR along with Sanger sequencing. So, I talked about central dogma is the same picture, but now I talk about something different which we are going to proceed in the next class. You know, I talked about the DNA, I talked about mRNA, I talked about protein. I will not talk about them now. Now I will talk about the whole genome content, whole DNA content is called genome. The whole mRNA content the, is called transcriptome. The whole protein content is called proteome and the molecules generated through the action of enzymes are called metabolome. The finding of gene sequence, the finding of DNA RNA sequencing help us to start looking at the possibilities. We are not happy by only knowing the sequence of a single gene. We need automation, we need the technologies to come up with us, develop high throughput things so that instead of DNA, we could read genome, instead of mRNA, we could read transcriptome, instead of protein, we could read proteome and if we could do that, we could also understand the functional molecule in the body by getting the metabolome. Thank you very much. I will finish here. I will see you in the next class. Thank you for listening.